Hey guys. Yeah, no. Surprise. I didn't announce anything. I <laughs> didn't warn any of you guys, but I kind of want to do this now because I know later on when I wake up, I'm probably not going to be in the mood and that will be cheating you guys. And it's been a bit since I've done one of these live. I think last month. Whatever. So, yeah, I got home from work a little while ago, and there was something interesting on my front porch. So, um, I figured this would be a good time, you know, while I'm still awake before I have to go to bed, because I work nights, and it's like 9, after 9 o'clock over here. Um, I figured this would be a good time to open it up. <laughs> I just got it. I, I'm pretty sure I know what it is, but at the same time, I don't know what it is. But it'll be fun to unbox it. So, let's go and do that. We're going to do this now. Now, even though this is a live stream and I am notorious for having my live streams go on way longer than I expect them to, this time I'm not expecting this to be hours upon hours because I do need to get some rest at some point. So, ugh, we're going to be taking care of this. This showed up at my porch. Uh, and, yeah, we need to see what this is. We need to see what this is. Oh, there's a lot of static noise. Not good. <sighs> I thought I fixed this mic. That does not make me happy. I wonder if it's my new speakers, because I have been getting some weird feedback from them. If I turn this off... Alright, I'm gonna cut that off. And you let me know if you're still getting a lot of static. Am I still getting static? And by the way, hello. Um, any, um, hello to the guys in the chat. Hello, Tyler. Hello, Accu King. Hello, Pavel. Um, but are you guys still getting that static sound? Because I, um, yeah, I just turned off the speakers. I've been getting some weird feedback with my speakers lately. So, still static. <laughs> Well, you know what? I hate to do this, but we're going to have to do this. I got no choice. We're going to have to do this. I'm going to have to change the mic. And then I got to figure out what the hell's going on. So, we're going to go on the properties on the mic. And we're going to switch this to the mic that I hate. All right. Now, let me know how it sounds. I switched to the camera mic. So, tell me how that one's going. Oh, and yeah, I know normally you should just unplug and replug. The problem is doing the unplugging and replugging. Yeah, it's going to be echoey. There's not much I can do about it. It's the freaking built-in camera mic. I hate it. I would prefer to use this, but the problem with this one is that it's connected to a sound box, which is connected to an amplifier, and the sound box, every now and then, you got to fiddle with it. So when you get that static, that means I need to go back there to fiddle with it. And I don't feel like crawling back there and doing that right now while I'm doing a live stream. I, sh I should have tested this freaking thing before. Yeah, it's going to be muffly. I just switched the mic. I switched to that one. We're going to have to settle for this for now. I'm sorry. I'm seriously thinking that I might just need to get rid of this setup and just go with one of those USB mics. But I, I don't really want to do that. But I might not have a choice here. So, anyway. Like I said, this showed up in the mail. And it is huge. Um, in fact, I'm going to stand up to give you guys an idea of just how big it is. So, uh, I'm gonna go back here. So, yeah, that's the top of it. You can just barely see the top. And I'm over here. So, yeah, to give you an idea of how tall it is. So that, yeah, this is pretty big. So I already have an idea of what's in here. Um, you know, but it's still gonna be nice to actually see it. So, time to chop this up. Hey, one man for all. Um, hey Midas, and hey Logan. So, let's slice into this using, once again, one of the pretty knives. This one, again, is a gift from Skull, who, yep, I need to, I uh, need to chat with him later. I, um, I haven't touched base with him, actually, I talked with him earlier this week, but I am hoping, because now is my weekend, uh, I work four days a week, and today is the first of my three-day weekend. Um, I am hoping that I can set up, if he's free, another fighting game match. 
he happens to be really, really good at um, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. Like, really freaking good. So he's kind of forcing me to get back into shape with that game because I haven't played it in a while. But I'm also thinking of trying to get him into Absolver. I finally started playing Absolver. Um, there is a viewer, um, goes by the name um, Sadworm. For those of you who remember my um, holiday live stream, oh, this is something completely different from what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> completely different from what I thought it was going to be. Okay, still pretty cool though. Um, but yeah, um, you might remember I was playing Tekken against him. He um, finally got me to seriously start playing Absolver, and man, that game is really cool. I kind of wish I had gotten into it earlier when there were a lot more people playing it. But surprisingly, there are still people playing it. The servers are still up. And um, it's, I mean, the thing I like about it is that it plays like a pretty decent fighting game. And, you know, you got to, you know, know your frames and, you know, like know the right time to strike. But it's a very simplistic game. There's only two strike buttons. I mean, there's like, you know, a somewhat complicated way to switch stances, which kind of reminds me of Machida Blade in that sense. Um, but it, in a weird sort of way, it sort of kind of, it, it, like, listen to it this way. If you happen to have a background in fighting, that might actually help you in this game because you got to get timing right and know exactly when to dodge and exactly when to block and you got to watch your stamina meter and things like that. It's a pretty cool game. It's almost like a, it's almost like a hand-to-hand -hand Dark Souls in, in a strange sort of way. Anyway, actually, being in the EU, Aqua King would not mess you up with Absolver. I was playing, the dude I'm playing against is in Singapore, and the connection was silky smooth. So if that worked, I think that we might have a chance with that. And also, like, Tekken, I know it would work, because I was playing against people in London in Tekken 7, so I know that. Anyway, this is what showed up. And I was completely wrong on what I thought this was going to be. I thought this... And yes, this is again from LK Chen. So... Thank you once again, guys from LK Gen. But I thought this was actually going to be another blade, a particularly long one of theirs. And instead, this is their two-handed practice sword. Impressive. Most impressive. <laughs> yeah, pretty tall, isn't it? Look at this. Just like the actual ones. And a good weight to it. Good weight, good balance. Doesn't feel flimsy. That's one thing about these. Um, I forgot the name of the material that they tend to use for practice swords like these. Poly, polyurethane, poly something. Um, a lot of the ones I've handled, the blades tend to be a little too like wobbly when they get pretty long. But this one's nice and stiff, but not so stiff that if you thrust, it's going to do a lot of damage. But that's the, the weird balance you have to do with training swords. you got to make sure that they're safe enough for practice. Um, but thanks, Woody Chipper. Yeah, polyurethane. Um, they have to have the right balance, and you want them to have a decent amount of weight and just the right amount of stiffness so you can, you know, do your strikes right. You know, and it, you want it to feel as close to a real sword as possible. But it has to be safe enough so that you're not going to, you know, permanently damage the person that you're fighting against. This is one of the reasons why, you know, people have been moving away from, well, depending on who you talk to, you know, some people feel that wooden swords are a little bit too hard, especially if you're thrusting with them, because there's no give. So you might, you know, mess up some ribs or something. Uh, of course, like, if you're someone like Scott Rodell, then, yeah, you, you'll swear by wooden swords, and I don't blame them. In fact, I'm not against wooden swords myself, but I understand why people would rather use something that they consider to be a little bit safer. So this piece of piece here would be safer but I like the fact that it's still stiff enough so that if you get clacked with it then that should be you know you, oh man I, that hurt and then hopefully you'll learn to not get hit again because say what you want about pain but it is a good teacher so I like the wrapping on this very tight just like their swords feels good in the hand they didn't skimp on it it's going to be fun to mess around with. I know my son's going to want to grab it, but this blade is just about as tall as he is. So it's going to be kind of funny. Well, how's the flex? Good question. Let's find out. So, like I said, it's pretty stiff. Let me 
move over here for the camera so you can see. It's pretty. It, it, it feels a lot like the, the flex that I see with the real ones, to be honest. It has a, maybe it's a little bit flexier than the real one, but there's still that kind of flex. I like the feel of this. Really do. Really like the feel of this. Yeah, it's. And I got two of them, so I'll have somebody to practice with. <laughs> So let's see if the other one is, I mean, well, the other one's going to be pretty much the same, but. Come on. I'm really glad that this is just, like, bubble wrap and not freaking packing peanuts or styrofoam, because that would be unbearable. Um, yeah, pretty much the same thing. Similar flex. Mm -hmm. Snaps back nice and true. Good weight. See the balance real quick. Mm. Eh, pretty decent. Not too close to the hilt, not the handguard, not too far. There's going to be some, obviously some sacrifice with this, because I think the real one is a little bit further out, but it's still, it's pretty close. So it's not, I mean, you got enough weight so that you know there's going to be a decent strike, which would be similar to a decent cut. But there's still enough um, the, of the right amount of balance for good point control. It's still there, you know? There's still a good amount of balance for good point control. So I can get the point pretty much where I want it to go. It was nice in one hand, too, just like the real things. So yeah, these are nice. So I guess now I'm going to have to do a video on these as well. You guys might have remembered that um, a little while ago I had put up a message saying that maybe I should do a review video on other practice swords. I happen to have two one-handed versions and I've had them for quite some time actually. I also had some earlier ones that they never really put to market. It was a prototype and those, even though I really, really like those, yeah, they, they are not what some people would consider safe like they were just straight up hard freaking plastic like or hard nylon or actually damn it i was almost gonna say carbon fiber but that's not what it was they were pretty damn hard like you were going to get hurt they were pretty much as hard as wooden swords but with hard edges and they were going to they were going to mess you up um so they were just like nah, nah. They, they were originally practicing with those but they're like now nah, we can't can't put those to market they're not safe but I did get my hands on two of them, and I personally like them. In fact, I practice with those every now and then, do drills in the house when I don't want to accidentally, you know, gouge a hole in the wall and, you know, mess with those. Um, and in fact, in one of my earlier videos, you might have actually seen me um, messing around with them, the one where I actually ended up getting um, over 10,000 subscribers, which still surprises the hell out of me. So, oh, hey, Nick, what's up? Just noticed you had popped in there. Yep, yeah, high density. Yeah, that's pretty much. I think it is high density um, polyurethane. It's, it's really good. Um, but I like the feel of it. I like the balance of it. It's light, but not too light. It doesn't feel flimsy. And the one-handed variant that I had posted up a picture of when I was putting up messages. Same thing. This is just a two-handed version of that. Same decent quality. So, yeah, I, I want to kind of put these through their paces and then maybe do a proper video on those and maybe also show you what the older versions look like that. The, I don't know if that's worth doing that because, again, those green ones, you're not going to get those. <laughs> those are really, really early. I had gotten those when LK Chen was first starting out, to be honest, like when they were first refining the original LK5. Um, and I got my whole hand on those. I'm like, this is, this is nice. But then they told me this is a prototype. We're not, you know... But I would still like to show them off, just to show what could have been on the market, I guess, or the type of practice swords that I personally like to use. So, oh, Aluzi, uh, I don't know why I didn't see you. Um, Aluzi, Smoke God, can give you the name of this practice sword so you can check it out. Actually, I would, I would like to know the official name they gave it, so let me look it up real quick. Oh, and then I get that nice Mia doll on the screen. That's what I thought this was. 
because of how tall it was, I'm thinking, oh my god, did I get? I should have known from feeling the profile that it wasn't that because the Miyado has that kind of big round disc handguard, and I didn't really feel that on there. But eh, whatever. Okay, so let's see. Sparring white arc. What? Oh my god, they're making sparring versions of their swords now. Holy. So they got like metal. Wow. I didn't even know this. But I know they had to stay. I know about the sparring shield guard. And oh, now they got their um, protective vests too. I was I remember seeing that up on Facebook a while ago, but it's just kind of cool seeing on the website. Double hand sparring gen. That's what it is on their website. You gotta go to you gotta click on the more tab and then just go down the list and you'll see double hand sparring gen. And that's what this is. Good old double hand sparring gen. I sh would show the single handed versions, but they're upstairs, and I don't feel like going upstairs right now and coming back down because then you're gonna be staring at a silent background for at least 30 seconds or so, and that's always uncomfortable. So just wait for a video, I guess. Yeah, the sparring Han Gen is the one hand uh, the one handed version. And I like that a lot, but I need to do a full video on that. Swallowtail Spear. You know, if I was good at spear work, I would want to maybe get my hands on this as well. But I haven't really done much training with the spear. Very little. I should, though. Even if I don't plan on using that as my main weapon, just the basic training drills are very good at increasing your hand-to-hand -hand skill. If you practice Chinese martial arts anyway. But the basic movements are really good at helping you to learn how to generate power properly. It's one of the major reasons why, for instance, Baji Chuan is big on training the big spear. Because it just training that helps you to generate that experience really explosive power that that style is known for a, a lot more so and then the Chu Jian no what is this oh no this is just now the, now I'm just like looking at paintings and stuff okay but yeah just go over to the, the click on the more tab when you go to the main website and then just you'll see other weapons and then it's the double hand sparring Jian and that's what this is and then they also got their sparring Han Jian which again that, that that's the one-handed variant and those are cool, in my opinion. Okay, so what the fuck? Okay, so hold on. I just thank you for the um, thank you for the super chat donation. Um, Aku King it says, could I could somebody get me a Purple Heart trainer so that I can compare? Um, I guess at some point I would. I haven't. Okay. I want to say that I might have handled a Purple Heart training longsword, but I am not entirely sure. I don't want to make a liar out of myself. I've handled a lot of synthetics, and I want to say that maybe I have. Okay, let me put it this way. If Skull had Purple Heart training longswords, then I've handled one. Um, I don't know if my friend Nick, back with the historical um, fencing guild, I know he had a lot of synthetics. If any of those, because he had longswords and he had earlier one-handed arming sword ones, if any of those were pu purple um, heart armory, then yeah. Though actually, I might have a, a synthetic gen from Purple Heart, an older one. Um, see, now I want to check. Oh, heart. Um, they might, I might have had one of those. Hold on. Okay, so we're in the European ones, Hema gear. Huh. Swords, basic trainers, stabs, daggers, Game of Thrones, world martial arts, Chinese culture. There we go. I like the fact that they have, there we go, the Jin Synthetic Trainer. That looks different than the one I have, but I am pretty sure I've handled one of them. There was a two-handed version, that Synthetic Chang Jin version 2. Yeah, I'm thinking that I used to have the Synthetic Chang Jin version 1. But I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Skull had um, gifted me with that as well. I just never showed it on camera, but I, I've handled that one, and I can honestly say, just 
just from holding these compared to when I was messing around with those when we were kind of, you know, messing about in the park, um, I like the feel of these better. If, if I'm pretty sure um, if that's a Purple Heart one that I have, now that I'm going over it in my head, I like the feel of these better already. Um, let's see. Um, you know what? Since I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Extra Mile Ghost. Please forgive me for leaving. I'll try to move as fast as I can. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back. I, I'm going to bring that other synthetic I have, and then we can try to make some comparisons real quick. So give me about like 30 seconds to a minute or so. I'll try to move as fast as I can. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm back. Again, I am very sorry for departing like that. Live streams, you know, you usually want the person to be there all the time. So, uh, here we go. All right. So, this I am pretty sure is a Purple Hearts. They're, I think it's, this is their first version. Um, and I've kind of had it pressed against some other stuff. So, yeah, the blade's a bit bent. But it should hopefully get the true. And right away, I can tell you right away, it is so much easier to flex this. Like, there's like like almost no effort. It's a it's a bit of a floppier blade. Um, I do like. I'll talk, start talking about the positives of this one. I do like the fact that it has a metal handguard. Just it's something you usually don't see in synthetics, and I just happen to have liked the fact that they did that with this. Yep, this is definitely a purple heart. I just see the little sticker. Yeah. Yeah, confirmed it. So there you go. See, Purple Heart. The hand wrap on this is amazing. It's really, really good. Nice, thin, tight cord. Got your metal pommel there, metal hand guard. It's got a decent balance to it. And it's got an okay weight. Here's the problem I have with it. And this was the problem I had when I was um, testing it out back when I was up north with a certain skilled swordsman. This thing flops around a lot. There were times when I was trying to like aim strikes that it just would it would just drag in certain directions. So I'm like trying to aim at a certain spot and it would just pull you know my arm down. I, I would feel it and like I couldn't okay this to you guys would be a two-handed sword. And it is. But if you see my earlier videos, back when I was using that more contemporary Han Dian, which, let's not get into that, that one's also technically a two-hander and I use it one-handed. So when I was holding this, I'm like, oh, it's balanced enough for one hand, I can, I can, I can handle it. I could not easily use this with one hand because every time I kept trying to strike, it, the blade would just, bend and flop and throw off my strikes and it really frustrated the hell out of me let me lift this up you guys are probably tired of seeing me decapitated like i'm a dullahan or something okay so here yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that that good enough hmm? okay so yeah um i just found and even now it's still like right now it's got that permanent curve so i'm flipping it so that when i strike this way and i know even when i'm striking that way sometimes i feel it trying to go like that and it's really freaking annoying. Um, so I have to hold it with two hands if I really want to be good with it. And even then, if I'm like doing a cross strike or if I'm suddenly coming up like that, I will feel the thing kind of bend because it's, it's a bit of a, I guess they didn't want to make this too hard because they were worried about hurting people, but I just found it a little too prone to bending during fast strikes. Other people, they're, you know, their mileage may vary, but that was my struggle with it. 
Now, here's the one-handed one. This is their, the Han synthetic, which, by the way, is made very similarly to that. It's a little bit easier to bend because it's a lighter blade than the two-handed one, but it's still fairly stiff. And I notice, by the way, just to show you guys something, notice the blade lengths. They're pretty much the same. See? I'm putting it, um, I'm like blade to blade, handguard to handguard, right? This obviously has a longer one, so you can, because it's supposed to be the pure two-handed. This is a one-handed, and knows how long the blade is, because older Hanjin were long blades. When I'm holding this, it feels nicely balanced in this hand. If I want to hold it with two, I can, but it's not really ideal because of how close your hand is. So this is more for emergency. When I'm aiming, I can get it where I want. I don't feel it fighting me. I can get it where I want it to go. I can get it where I want it to go. See, it's not really giving me any problems here. So if I'm basically going through my drills, it's there, okay? Like I don't really feel the need so, you know, it, it just, it, it flows, it works, it goes where it needed to go. I'm not, it's again, and I'm not feeling the blade trying to bend. It just goes where I need to go because it's stiff enough. So, now let's switch it up to this freaking Dark Souls <laughs> Berserk Dragon Slayer version over here. <laughs> again, it's not flopping. Okay, it's stiff enough so that if I'm making my strikes, and I have to be careful because now I could accidentally hit something here. So I'm not going to be moving as fast. But I can get it where I want. I can get it where I want, and I'm not really worried too much about this thing flopping in the wind, unlike the other one where so many times I just felt it like pulling my arm down or like pulling it in a different direction. I just could not get my strikes fast enough, so it slowed me down. I'm not feeling that with these. So, I will say this though, I would not use these, and this is probably, this is probably goes without saying, I would not use these full contact on somebody without some kind of padding. That should, that should be obvious, right? This would hurt, <laughs> full force, this would sting a bit, you know? It's just, you know, this, 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 this would sting a bit. Now, for light drills, you know, if you're just standing in front of each other and you're going through routines, click, 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 you know, you're going through your standard routines, and as long as you guys are safe and you're not moving too fast and you guys both have some skill, yeah, you know, I could see people messing around with these, you know, without padding, but if you're going full force, I would suggest padding because it's going to hurt. Same thing with the purple armory one, believe it or not, even though it's a slightly soft, it's slightly softer, the blade, but this also has some weight to it. So if it hits, it's going to hurt. Like, it, it stung. When I, when I was using this and I was going up against another synthetic and it was whacking against me, I was glad that I had the padding. Really was. So let's see. Um, I saw some questions, but anyway, I hope that answered your question, Accu King. Um, how just a quick comparison from these to those. I feel that the build quality in these is really good, but I find the blade to be a little too much on the softer, whippier side with certain strikes. Now, granted, I think this is their version one. They now have a version two. I don't know if they improved the blade. I just know that this version, it's a little floppy, but I do treasure this because one, the build quality is still pretty good. Two, for basic solo drills and all that, it still got a good weight and balance to it. And three, it was a gift. It was a gift from one of my best friends. So despite my criticisms, I still treasure it. So there's that. Okay. Now, anyway, I hope that answered your question. So please shoot me the link. I will definitely shoot you the link, but um, it's just LKChen, uh, LKChenSword.com. If you just type that down and then you'll go right to the website and then you can find it by clicking on the more tab on the top of the screen and then look for the double hand sparring gen or the sparring han gen. And both of those are synthetics, are the synthetics. Sorry, it's, I know it's early in the morning for many of you, but it's 
sort of late at night for me, so to speak. This is when I'm about to go to bed. <laughs> in fact, right now is usually when I turn in. I work nights. Just, yeah. So brain is beginning to... Okay, Wing Zero. Hey, man. Uh, why didn't the Chinese develop European-style sabers since some of the practice versions do have baskets and guards? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> we could ask the same thing, I guess, about the Japanese. Why didn't they come up with that sort of thing? Though, it's funny. When you start looking at the later Qing period and later Western, like the Republican era, you start seeing a little bit of cross-colonization. Um, you start seeing, for instance, European blades fitted on... Um, Chinese handguards or, or hilts, sometimes you'll see ch um, European grips on Chinese blades. You start seeing a little bit of cross-pollinization going on, but that's toward that later period when cold weapons were no longer really the main thing to use. So, But I'm just going to simply say that the reason why they didn't develop those, um, it, cultural reasons, military of, um, as, um, aspects that were going on at that time period. There's a lot of different factors as to why weapons developed the way they did, depending on what culture you're in and how they happen to have practiced their particular military arts. So, yeah, look up the old Kung Fu issue about Wing Chun Long Pole. Yeah, I have, actually. Um, and it's kind of funny. The Long Pole is considered a very important training weapon for Wing Chun. But what cracks me up is if you start, if you stop and think about it for a little bit, it kind of doesn't make much sense. I mean, I'm glad it's there. I'm glad it's there as if I'm a judge of martial arts. What I mean is, it's a cool thing that it is there. It's a nice weapon to kind of complete and round out the system. But having said that, when you consider that Wing Chun is all about close range fighting, and then you have this long freaking pole that has to have you going, wait a second. And in fact, if you look at the training methods of the long pole, and then you look at the way Wing Chun employs other weapons in his bare hands, the two don't, I mean, they link, but it's its more like they kind of support each other. But you practice the pole in ways that you don't really practice the other weapons because the long pole came from a different system. This little, little trivia for you guys. There's a lot of funny little cross pollinization things in Chinese martial arts, by the way where you'll see a style, like, our style is complete, and it came from this, and if you look carefully, you're like, wait a minute, why do you guys practice this? This doesn't seem to fit with the rest of your curriculum because they got it from somewhere else. Sometimes it's to plug in a hole, or sometimes it's just because they happen to have had some practitioner in the school who came from a different style and joined them and really liked them, but he brought his skills in there and just became part. Things like that happen, just weird things from the outside will just join the curriculum. So, hey Scott, Scott McGregor is in, heading off to work, so he'll be listening in, cool. So you're going to work. I came back from work. Talking about me getting you one. And yes, yeah, called Oh, see how far behind I am in the questions? Aki King, I do appreciate you saying that you were going to be um, thinking of getting me one. Though, since I already have this, you don't have to. But I do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Skull's longsword would be a purple heart. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, yeah, Skull Grim has the penty. Uh, Christian at PHA has been developing new styles. Cool. Just going down and his flex and a little more rigid, like what I'm holding. So it looks like you guys are having a really good conversation on synthetics. Um, ah, hello, Joel. Now, I am way behind. I'm trying to hurry up and get this. Is that blade taking a set? If you're talking about this one, well, yeah, but that's because I had it propped against... This has been, like, propped against a wall in my bedroom, and I have a bunch of other swords leaned against it, so it just kind of... You know, if you just leave it like this, uh, leaning against the wall, sooner or later it's just going to... Like, that gravity is just going to take its toll, so I just kind of have to, like, bend it the other way to straighten it back out. It sucks, but it happens. <laughs> what I really need to do... I really need to just get myself a weapons rack like I used to have to kind of keep these synthetic swords from having that happen to them. And also, a lot of my other swords need that also, but I kind of re... Well, I was about to say I recently moved, but it's not really recently. I, I moved, like, just before summer of last year, but I just haven't had a chance to really situate all my stuff yet, and it's just now that I'm finally be able to get that stuff going, so... Um, going down the list, trying to see if there's any other questions... Armored gloves, obviously, using armored gloves would be a very good freaking idea with those. Um, 
So you can fix, fix the bend by laying it on the ground opposite the curve and putting some weight on it. Yeah, that's true. I, I've done that before. Good point. Um, good tip, I should say. Uh, thoughts on Yomikuni's Taiwei Chinese Han Sword? It looks just like LK Chen's Flying Phoenix. I've never even freaking heard of it. So let me take a quick look at that sword. Though I think I may already have an answer to your question when you're saying could they have been made in the same factory? Not necessarily. And this is something that I'm going to be giving you guys a little bit of a tidbit on um, Chinese swords being made in China. Like, you, <laughs> Let me put it this way. You will find similar swords everywhere when it comes to getting swords from China. And yeah, that does look a hell of a lot like a China, um, um, like a Flying Phoenix. But I'm thinking that they were looking... Here's the thing. It looks a lot like a Flying Phoenix, but I can tell right away it's not. I could tell right away just by looking at it that is not a flying. It looks similar. I could tell they copied the style, but it's not. One, the scabbard is different. The scabbard looks a lot like the contemporary Han Gen types that I've been seeing all over the place since about 2005, 2004, 2003. Um, the blade is different. The Flying Phoenix has a, for lack of a better term, a four sided blade. This is an eight sided blade. <laughs> It has a kind of more of that octahedral um, blade geometry to it. Whereas the Flying Phoenix has that diamond profile geometry to it. So, like, right away, I just could glance at it and could tell that's not from LK Chen. Now, you might be going, but it looks very similar. Well, here's something that you will notice a lot about stuff coming from China. It's not just with swords, it's with a lot of stuff, but it's definitely prevalent in the Chinese martial arts weapons market. If there is a design you know, or a certain particular item, good, whatever, if there's a sword that got popular, that people really like, it's going to get copied. And it's going to get copied fast. <laughs> really, really fast. You may remember, some of you may remember way, 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 way back when I first reviewed that Han Jin from that company, um, Jin Shi which, again, that company was pretty cool. May they rest in peace. I, wonder, I hope sooner or later they might come back, but I don't know if they will um, in these days and times with the current market. But when I got that sword from them, that particular blade cost me just under $300, which is a good price for that blade. I still think it's a pretty good sword for what it is. That blade, however, is a copy of a sword made by a famous swordsmith in China, I uh, believe by the name of Zhang Wu. And when he first um, made that design, like he based it on several different pieces, uh, like Hanjin that were unearthed from tombs. Like he like kind of mixed and matched different things he saw. Like he was like, okay, I like this scabbard, but I'm gonna put this particular scabbard piece on it, and I'm gonna take this handguard and put it on, and kind of made his own Hanjin out of like just mixing that and making copies of that. And then he came up with that sword that looked really freaking cool, right? His cost over a thousand freaking dollars because Zhang Wu is considered to be this master smith. And I remember the first time I saw it, I'm like, I'm going to own that sword one day. I don't give a damn how. I don't know. Like, at the time, I was broke, too. But I'm like, I'm going to find a way to own that. That's the gen I want. That's Because it was the most unique-looking gen at the time. These days, they're like a dime a dozen, that design. But back then, when, when Zhang Wu first made his reproduction, or should I say interpretation, it was the only one. And you could only get it from his forge. There were, or people who were selling it in like European markets. Like there were a, f a handful of like um, vendors who were who commissioned from his forge to get that blade. No one else had that design for at least a good year or two. And then slowly but surely, other people began copying it and making cheaper versions of it. Not necessarily crappier versions, there are a lot of crap versions of it, but just basically cheaper versions. Like they weren't necessarily, okay, this one's made out of special folded steel, which is going to use a mono steel blade, right? Okay, they use a certain type of wrap. We're going to go with cotton instead of whatever silk they use or whatever. They, they, they cut down the price. And nowadays, the market is flooded with these. So now you can get yourself a blade, a folded bladed version of that for around 300 bucks. Whereas the one I got at the time it cost 300, I'm pretty sure I can get one exactly like that for maybe half the price. Once the, you see this with the sword markets, all the time in China. 
This is the reason why, for instance, a Tongdao, there's a certain design that I see for Tongdao on the market that everybody and their mother uses. Everybody and their mother copies it. It's one that I like, and I have a feeling sooner or later I'm going to end up having one on the rack, simply because I've always liked it, but I see it everywhere. Everyone's copying it. Um, it it's just like, again, the Hanjin. Everyone's copying it. If somebody has a design, if somebody has a blade that gets popular in the market, they see it's flying off the shelves, it's selling, they're, so, they're going to copy it, and soon everybody and their mother's going to get it. It's kind of, hell, I started seeing this with LK Chen Swords. Um, it's, th this is not the first time I've seen somebody try to copy, like, this is a lot more, a lot closer to the ones that LK Chen makes, but I was already starting to see copycats since last year. Um, like, w after, and I noticed it was after I started putting my videos out talking about the company. Again, I'm not trying to say I'm a trendsetter. I'm just simply saying, when I did my review on the LK5, I noticed a couple of months later, I started seeing Hanjin that still looked like the contemporary ones in the market, but the handles were shaped differently. They were no longer just those round broomstick handles that we always saw. Now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing them with that more ovoid shaped design that LK Chen sort of having where and where toward the pommel it gets skinnier I started seeing that but you didn't see that before the LK Chen ones came out and I knew that was going to happen at some point like I was in fact when I saw that I was like okay that means this company's going to do well that means their swords must be selling they won't copy the design of somebody's not I mean if it's not selling why copy right but the fact that it got noticed people started buying them the word got around other people started reviewing them. Now, all of a sudden, everyone's copying them. <laughs> not exactly, though. They're not exactly the same. And in fact, I, let me just check something. I, I, I'm curious about something. Blade length is 81 centimeters, so I'm expecting that. Default option, magnesium steel. I want to know what the weight is. I'm curious about the weight. I'm very curious about the weight. They don't have it, though. Usually they'll tell you. And I love how they said this is our budget sword. Next, their budget sword's going for two hundred and eighty-nine dollars. <laughs> I'm not trying to disparage the company because it probably is a really nice sword. I have to admit, I do like. I mean, it's it's nice seeing a one-handed version of that with that particular type of blade, and I do like that type of scabbard. But it's just just kind of funny to me. It's. <laughs> It's, yeah, there's just certain things that just make, hmm, that, that, that's the market. That's, what I'm seeing is not surprising me. This is nothing new. This is the Chinese sword market. But I, you know, I was complaining just a few years back that other people in other sword arts are spoiled for choice. In the Chinese sword market, we just had very few people to choose from, and most of it was crap. And now we got like people copying each other everywhere, but even though they're copying over each other and you're seeing so many different people now selling all these swords, at least they're better quality than what we used to get. Hell of a lot better quality than what we used to get. Sheesh. Again, anybody in Chinese martial arts who remembers the swords that we practice with and honestly who a lot of people these days still practice with, the, um, I need to get back to that school. Um, but um, they, to give a, a, a shout out to the International Wudan Academy over in Seattle, pretty good school. You want to learn some China, um, traditional Chinese martial arts, but with an emphasis on actual sparring and like application and stuff like that. That's a good school to go to. Um, but it kind of it was interesting to me that even in this day and time, there were a lot of the students were still using those Long Chuan knockoffs that I used to be able to pick up in Chinatown for like sixty bucks. <laughs> 60 bucks, 30 bucks, like it, it, crappy stuff. Like they had no real edges. It, it, it weren't balanced that well. I started coming in with my stuff and they're like, whoa, what is this? Because they, they didn't know. <laughs> There's a lot of, even to this day, there are a lot of people in Chinese martial arts that are practicing with stuff that's, they're not great quality. So word still needs to get around. So I kind of rambled quite a bit on that one topic. But yeah, the um, Taiwei um, Chinese Han Sword, it, yeah, it, it's not made by the same guys. I can tell you that right now. In fact, even before I looked at it, I was pretty sure it wasn't being made by the same guys. Because the LK Chen guys, believe it or not, they're still kind of small. And um, like, 
the last I heard, there were pretty much only two guys. <laughs> like there was one main smith and then they moved over to another smith. Like now they had two smiths working on different blades. They might have increased it to a couple more smiths, but there weren't, there weren't that really that many people. So if I'm starting to see different names, different company names, I would be very shocked if it was all coming from one place, um, LKHN, especially considering what I know about what they went through to start making those swords in the first place. And also the fact that part of the reason why I was so impressed with the LKHN stuff was because of the weight and balance. It was the first time that I was actually able to hold a one-handed sword with those blade lengths and it being under two pounds. That was something that just a couple of years before that I was told was impossible because people had forgotten how to make swords that way in China. They sort of had to work backwards to remember how to make swords like that. Like they got decent enough at making katana and then they're like, okay, now that we know how to make katana, we'll just make straight katana. Like we'll just make a katana or the way we make katanas, we'll just do that for Jen. And I mean, yeah, you end up with a pretty nice blade and maybe some good fittings, but the balance was not necessarily correct, or the weight was just a little bit heavier than what may have been made in the past. And then all of a sudden, LK Chen comes around, and they somehow were able to make these blades at a balance and a lightness that I personally feel is closer to what was used at the time. Now, of course, then we can start arguing about, well, what about Ming and Qing Dynasty swords, which tended to be around two pounds and up? And yeah, you can have a good argument there, but even then, I find that from what I was told about the antiques and again from what Scott Rodell told me about antiques and I still need to hurry up and finish editing that video and put that one up. Yeah, what people were churning out up until just a couple of years ago, they were not close to the real thing. I mean, and if you were going to get something that was as close as like what they feasibly could do at the time, you were going to be spending close to a thousand bucks. And even then, there was no guarantee. So. All right, so LKH was very clever with the marketing, giving out a few dozen swords to various users. Yeah, they really got clever with the marketing. Um, I guess they just, because again, when they reached, it, it's funny, when they first reached out to me, it was only because, like, I, the first LKH sword I actually reviewed was one that I bought off of someone else who knew about the company, and I had no clue who they were. This was back when they were still pretty much, um, they were exclusive in China. Like they didn't have, they didn't really have a Western market at all. Um, but because of that video I, I did about like, if you know, you might remember an older video I did called like, is a Hanjin like good for you? Like I was talking about how, because it has a round handle, a beginning student may not want to mess with it just yet. And then I get a message from the dude who's like, um, those handles are wrong. And then he told me about how, the LK Chen guys make it correct. I'm like, really? He says, I happen to have one over here that I used. I got other ones. You want it? And he sold it to me. And I was a like, hell of impressed. And I did my sword review. And then that's when he was like, oh, by the way, they're making others. Do you want to get your hands on those? I'm like, fine. And it just exploded from there. Now, here's the thing. They must have seen, whoa, this one little YouTuber does reviews. And now all of a sudden we got a Western market. What if we start you know, getting bigger YouTubers, guys who are a lot more well-known to review these. And it just kind of blew up from there. They, they basically stick with going to influential guys. And yeah, to be honest, it's a bright move. If they just simply kept it with me, I doubt that their name would have exploded as big as it was. Because again, I'm just some tiny dude in the corner. You know, that this channel is not huge and it's not, if I'm going to be honest, it's not really all that great. I'm just a hobbyist who every now and then throws these videos up. I don't have big production stuff, and I don't have time to really do the videos that other people do with the amount of care that they do with the frequency that they do. So going to bigger guys like, you know, um, School Gladiatoria, um, Scholar Grimm, you know, those guys, and then handing it out to them and say, review these, yeah, th that was clever. That was really freaking smart. And at the same time, they don't have to go crazy with ridiculous marketing. And now... You can even buy their swords over freaking um, Cult of Athena. So they've gone a long way in just a year and a half. A year and some change, don't you think? Like, and personally, I think they deserve the success. I like their swords. I think that they're pretty decent. They just need to keep up with the quality control. <laughs> That's my one thing. Don't let up on the quality control.
because there are a couple of pieces here and there where it's like the glue gets messed up. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> to be fair, that happens with a lot of other swords too. Okay, um, Hector, you were asking, did you mix, miss the unboxing? Yeah, basically, but I'll show you what was in the package. It was two of these. These big, honky, two-handed synthetic monstrosities. And I will review these at some point soon. So here you go. Ugh. That's what it was. That's what was unwrapped, so to speak. So, the is better than the competition. Sending out some. Yeah, it's, I, too much insulation. We need cross disciplines and discuss gear. And I agree, but this is old news between you and me, Nick. Uh, we always talked about how cross pollinization is important with martial arts. And in fact, despite what a lot of traditionalists will believe or what they may tell you, Chinese martial arts did get a lot of, it developed through cross pollinization, through many styles within China and even from without. In fact, Asian martial arts period developed into their modern day forms through cross pollinization with Western fighting. And there are a lot of traditionalists who don't want to hear that, but it's true. Um, there's a guy named Jesse Encamp, I think. Um, he does videos mostly on karate. And he has a great video on how a lot of the kicks in karate are actually taken from French Savat. That might throw some people for a loop. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, a lot of the kicks in, in um, karate, especially the really high fancy kicks, came from French Savat. And yeah, he's got a lot of good evidence to back that up. Which, honestly, it makes a lot of sense when you consider that karate, or old school Okinawan karate, is similar to a lot of southern style gong fu styles, you know, southern wushu styles, and those styles didn't have a lot of fancy kicks. The kicks were pretty much low level and sim pretty simple, just effective, direct, just knock them down type kicks. The fancier stuff, yeah, um, yeah, it, <laughs> it came from elsewhere. So his channel's amazing, by the way, for it. Like, if you want to get some really good information on Japanese karate and, and its development, great channel. Highly recommend it. Since I'm like, you know, a martial arts nut, I don't, I, you know, I, I try to research things not just Chinese martial arts. I mean, I know that's the wheelhouse that I threw myself in, but I just like learning about different styles, period. And so I love his channel for the stuff that I, you know, that he talks about with karate. But yeah, just the fact that these days people look at karate, there's a complete system, great striking system, and it's kicks. A lot of it came from a completely different martial art that wasn't even native <laughs> to their own culture. And yet they're still like, no, these are karate kicks. Yeah, they made it their own. There's no reason why other styles can't take something from somewhere and make it their own. A lot of traditionalists really, they're terrified of that. And I don't really see the reason why, considering that if you look at the development of their own arts, they took things from elsewhere and made it their own. Again, look at the six and a half point pole in Wing Chun. That originally wasn't a Wing Chun weapon. It came from elsewhere. They made it their own. <laughs> See, so this I can go on and on with that. But. Um, it's only been a year. <laughs> it's been a long year. Yeah, twenty twenty's been a very long year. <laughs> Though, but as I said in my other long live stream, yes, twenty twenty was a horrible year. But if the lessons from twenty twenty were learned, and if people looked at it, I'll just simply say, as I said back then. You have to destroy in order to build. There's a lot of rebuilding that needs to be done in world culture. Take that as you will. Okay. Isn't that what MMA is? Honestly, yeah. Um, mixed martial arts is just that. Mixed martial arts. You take stuff that works and you make it your own. It's kind of, you know, sad that people like mixed martial arts and they got this image in their head of how a mixed martial artist fights. They got one style. But you pay attention, you realize, oh, these mixed martial artists, they got their own way of, they just take what works for them and they'll come out there. Yeah, they got a mix of grappling. Yeah, you're going to see some grappling. Yeah, you're going to see some boxing. You're going to But how they put it together, it's their own thing. And if they want to later on go off and make their own school, it's going to, after a while, develop into something different than the way it started. That's martial arts. 
So, lawyers love to hang out and exchange ideas. Yeah, they do love to exchange ideas. That's, I mean, if you research a lot of Chinese martial arts history, that happened a lot. You'll find some, it wasn't always just some dude kicking down the front door. I think your style's useless. Oh yeah, <laughs> you beat me up, now I'm your friend. It didn't always happen that way. Many times it'll be one expert going to another expert and they'll sit down and trade notes. And they'll be like, man, uh, yeah, I've heard you were really good at this and that, that and this. Yeah, and I heard you were really good at this, that, that and this. Hey, come over to my house. Let's talk some, let's talk shop. Sit down, drink some tea. So I hate feel if you hit him, you scramble his brains and knock him the fuck out. That's pretty cool. Now, if you do this and do it from this court through, you'll mess him up. Oh, really? Let's try that out. Look, same thing we're doing now. Everybody's going to get nerdy about something that they're passionate about, especially if they bump into somebody else who has that same passion. This happened a lot in the past, and nowadays with, you know, our cultures and our worlds a lot closer these days with the internet and all that type of stuff, we're just doing it on a global scale, and it's happening a lot more rapidly, and it, things are developing and evolving a lot more rapidly, but it's pretty much the same thing. Just, you know, people coming together and trading notes and getting a bigger picture of how to advance their passion, or their field of knowledge, their art, their skills. It's happening everywhere. Cooking, uh, different art styles, movie styles, science, philosophy. People are getting together, getting more different viewpoints, and making things a lot more evolved and efficient. And the only people that have a problem with this are those stuck in older, outdated ways of thinking who think that you can't do that. That completely destroys it. Not really, no. <laughs> God, can't be afraid of change. And you can't be afraid of going, you know, meeting people with different viewpoints. Even if you don't necessarily agree with their particular viewpoint, it still gives you something to think about with your own thing. I mean, hell, again, I'm not, I don't consider myself the greatest source person in the world, not even close. But I wouldn't have even begun to get an understanding of how to start using the few sword skills I had in an effective way if I had not bumped into a Western swordsman. Just saying. I'm telling you the God honest truth. I, for a long time, the few little sword skills I had, and back then it was even way meager than what I know now, and even now I consider what I know to be mediocre. But when I was first, I, I knew a form and I knew some basics, and I was trying my best to try to make it work, but I'm mostly learning from other people who never sparred seriously against somebody else. And then I bump into a certain rapier lover out there and started trading notes with him, and suddenly I'm like, oh, that's how you use this. I had to bump into somebody else to get an idea of how my techniques work. Trading notes with somebody else from a different perspective can sometimes just open doors that you originally weren't able to open by staying within the same perspective. Just saying. Um, so those one-handed trainers are only 100 bucks for two? Yeah, the prices, LK Chen's prices tend to be pretty decent, I think. They, they're... they're They've been getting pretty savvy in how they've been um, pricing their stuff. Okay, so... Anyways, yeah, it is 10.29 over here. I need to close my eyes and get some sleep. I got... This weekend's gonna be nuts. I gotta get the car fixed. I gotta get... I gotta go to my doctor's appointment. Um, don't worry, nothing serious. I just haven't had a decent checkup in a while. Um, and then I gotta... I am behind on videos, and I'm behind on a lot of other stuff, so I, I really need to get on that, but... Yeah, this was at my front door, and I'm like, okay, I, let me do this now, because I know I'm going to procrastinate if I don't do this now. Um, yeah, two-handed trainers. So far, I mean, just from my first impressions, I like the build. I like the quality. Really like the wrap. Balance and everything. It's going to be fun knocking these about. And I, at least I got people in the house that I can actually, here, put this in your hand. Let's go in the backyard. Let's swing them around see how good they are. You know, I, I got people I can test these with. Um, it's going to be fun. And then I'll record the footage. And I still, I know I'm behind on other stuff. The Scott Rodell Den, still, I need to get, um, the Scott Rodell Den, I still need to finish the review on that one. That one yielded some surprising results, by the way. It's going to be interesting putting that one up. Um, then I got to do the comparison one, like, okay, you know, we got three swords that are kind of similar, and compare how different and how similar they are. I got those other videos I want to do. Oh, yeah, I'm so freaking behind. Huh. <sighs> I just need to like, you know, just sit down with a bowl of green tea one day and just churn them all out. So, 
Alright. Drive. Best of whip to you. Thank you very much. Um, hope you guys appreciated the video. I hope you guys were entertained by it. And I hope that I'll be able to get some stuff out for you guys soon. Not just the martial arts. I got other videos I need to do. It's not just sword martial arts related that I need to get out as well. Especially with what happened in the past couple of weeks. Sheesh. I got some shit to do. But anyway. Catch you guys later. You know, hope you guys like the stream. And yeah. Take care.